So I've titled today's message, Displays of Faith. And again, Hebrews chapter 13. So while you're turning there, um, yeah, well, by the way, if you need a Bible, let us know. We'll, we'll get one for you. Uh, we got some in the back, and, um, and we'll, yeah, we'll provide one for you. Now, I'm not sure if any of you have ever noticed, but much of the New Testament, especially the epistles, the letters, they follow a, a common pattern. For the most part, every writer will give some kind of theological instruction, which will then be followed by some practical application. And so, in other words, there's first theology and then practicality. Well, in this final chapter of Hebrews, the writer does the same thing by shifting his focus from doctrine to duty, from vertical to horizontal, from love, of, love for God to love for the church. But before diving into our passage today, we should just quickly again review what the author, what the author has just previously said. I just finished saying, Back in chapters 11 and 12, the writer began exhorting, the writer began by exhorting believers about the importance of running the great race marked out for us. However, as he does this, he's also maneuvering closer and closer to the theological point he wants everyone to clearly know and understand. And God is a consuming fire. So now the question becomes this. Since God is both the consuming fire of Mount Sinai and the consuming love of Mount Zion, how ought we to live, especially in the church? Well, this is the question that the author will answer next as we move on to chapter 13. However, here now, in the passages we're going to be covering, the author will cover, again, some practical applications in order to encourage us, in order to encourage the readers um, in the faith to grow in holiness. And so in these first six verses, we're going to, be looking at. We're going to learn some ways we as believers, as Christians, can do that. And in these verses, again, we're going to be covering a bunch of issues, topics, practical, again, tool, practical applications that we can apply into our own lives. But also, I think these, some of these subjects may make some people uncomfortable because of their controversial, right now they're pretty controversial. So uh, I would say just prepare yourselves, buckle in, because there may be some things that you may feel uncomfortable with, but just keep in mind that I'm just the messenger. This is the word of God, and this is coming directly from him. And you'll understand what I mean as we go through this passage and this message. So let's open up with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning again. Lord, Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this opportunity we have to open up your word and read the truths that you've given us. And so now I pray that we will listen carefully. May we just totally understand what you're trying to say here, Lord, and that Again, it's not, what, it's not what the world wants, Lord. But again, it's what you have to say. And so now we want to hear from you. Speak to us. Fill this room with your spirit. Lord. May we honor you now, right, right now with our time and our ears and our hearts. Thank you. Pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 13, 
verse 1. The Word of God says, Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality. For by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Remember those in prison as though you were in prison with them and the mistreated, as though you yourselves were suffering bodily. Marriage is to be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled, because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? If you were with us last week, we saw how the writer of this letter ended the previous section by telling us about the privileges and joy of being on Mount Zion. He wrote there at the end of verse 12, Therefore, since we, have, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. By it, we, serve, we may serve God acceptably with reverence and awe. And as we just read, he now begins to tell us specific ways to apply what he had just been saying, what he just finished saying. Now, before getting into them, I want you to keep in mind that the overall emphasis of the last few chapters have pretty much been living by faith. In chapter 11, the writer presented the great examples of faith. And in chapter 12, he told us why we ought to be encouraged to faith. And so now he presents things we can do individually and corporately that are evidences of faith if we're really walking by faith and not by sight. And that's why, again, I've titled today's message, Displays of Faith. The first he mentions is love. Let brotherly love continue. And again, let me also add, let brotherly love, let sisterly love continue. The word love here is the ancient Greek word Philadelphia. Now, many of you know there are different types of love. Well, here, this particular Greek word is Philadelphia. And it's used to describe brotherly friendship and affection Christians have for one another. This love is familial, is a familiar relationship. Unbelievers cannot in any way understand. See, the world talks about the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God, but it doesn't really believe in God as father. So it really has no concept of brotherhood. You know what I mean? It's if they don't understand the fatherhood of God, they're not really going to understand the brotherhood of believers. But Christians are joint heirs with Christ. We saw that. We talked about that a little bit yesterday, or last week. And so by virtue of our union with him, we're also sons and daughters of God. So you see, faith in Christ, it makes us all a family. So by saying, let brotherly love continue, it was a writer's way of affectionately exhorting them. He was telling them that they're, that they're doing a wonderful job, an amazing job outstanding job demonstrating godly affection toward one another. So they must not allow it to stop. 
they have to continue in that brotherly love. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the old Peanuts cartoons. Well, there's a, a good one that is around that has some profound insight into human nature. And there in that cartoon strip, Linus shouts, I love mankind. It's people that I can't stand. Now, I think that there are times that all of us can relate to that. You know, yeah, we love mankind as believers, but it's just people. Certain people we just can't stand. When we hear messages about, about love, we all tend to think, amen, preach it, brother. My wife needs to hear this one. My kids, they need to hear it. Lord, help them to pay attention. But me, well, I'm basically loving. I'm a loving person. It's just part of my nature. The truth is, we all overrate ourselves in the area of love. We love mankind. But do you love your wife and kids? Do you love difficult family members? Do you love those in the church? If so, how did you show it in your words and behavior this past week? If they irritated you, did you respond with patience and kindness? Did you get angry? Go through that list in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and, and also other biblical passages about love <clears throat> and you will see that you have you all have room to grow in loving people. I have room to grow in loving people, not mankind. Our goal again, what we need to do is to love the people around us, those that are closest to us, to love them more, care for them more. But yes, those here in the church as well. Well, in verse 2, the author teaches that this brotherly love should even extend beyond the church by showing hospitality and love to strangers. Because, astoundingly, some of those angels, I mean, some of those strangers just might be angels. Now, we often don't know with whom we're dealing with, with whom we're visiting, who is approaching us. This is something that we need to keep in mind, though it shouldn't motivate us, shouldn't motivate our love. We simply don't know who we're really seeing when we notice a beggar on the side of the road or a, a person in the hospital without a visitor or someone in prison, you just don't know who you might really be seeing. The person we see might not be who we think we're seeing. And in any case, we must show those in our paths hospitality for the glory of God. Hospitality is an important Christian gift, but sadly, it's often a neglected one. Frankly, it's an aspect of our Christian calling about which we can learn much from our non-Christian friends. Now, for instance, I'm not sure if you knew this, but Muslims and Mormons put an absolute premium on hospitality. They're really, really hospitable people. And so knowing this, again, it's, it's embarrassing knowing that there are a lot of Christians out there that even can't be hospitable 
towards another Christian. A brother and sister in Christ, we're all called to be to show hospitality to everyone. Yes, even to strangers. Now, we must also use discernment. I'm not saying that you just should allow any strange person into your house, around your family, around your kids. I know and understand that there are dangers and behind that. And I honestly believe that if a person that uh, came across your path and needed some hospitality, I really believe the spirit that's living in you would warn you of that danger. If you're a person that's living by the spirit, that is in constant prayer, is in, on a constant lookout for signs and wonders from God, Lord, Lord just to, to bless you, you will begin to see some of these divine appointments. So just again, be on the lookout for that. Be careful, use wisdom, discernment. You know, I had to, you know, a few weeks ago, we had a discussion about this and, you know, we, we talked about who we should allow into our house, who we shouldn't, you know, and, and really it's a discussion I know that you must have with your own family. But again, you never know. You never know who you might be entertaining. Yes, it actually might be an angel of the Lord. Now, as we move on, verse 3 addresses our responsibility to those in prison who are also part of the body of Christ. Now, I'm personally thankful, among many other things, for many Christians, for those Christians who through, who, through uh, the centuries have given witness to Christ by serving in prison ministries. I know several great men of God who are currently serving in prison ministries. And that's their heart. That's their calling to go out and minister to the prisoners. I'm thankful for their obedience to remember those who are in prison as though they were in prison with them. And so we ought to do the same. We ought to remember, we ought to remember those who are in prison. We ought to pray for them, keep them in our prayers. Now, it's helpful to place this exhortation first in a historical context of ancient jails. In the first century, prisons weren't just pla weren't places one was sent for uh, any length of time. Now, for the most part, prison was a place where one was held for trial and a lot of times just for debts. And so if you, if you were imprisoned at that time, you were, it was more likely, more than likely, it was because you had failed to repay a really large debt. Now, otherwise, if you wouldn't have gone to jail or prison, you would eventually have been sold into slavery to pay off that debt. However, it's also true that later on, as the church got established, and as more and more persecution of Christians began, and when Emperor Nero started going after the Christians here in the early church, it wasn't unusual for Christians to be arrested and imprisoned and put to death, and put to death, to death for their faith. And so to identify with these prisoners might be dangerous. Yet Christ's love demanded, it demanded a ministry to them. Now, according to Matthew chapter 25, verses 36 and 40, we're told that to minister to a Christian prisoner in the name of Christ is to minister to Christ himself. In our free country where we're not arrested for our religious beliefs, but in other parts of the world, believers 
suffer. They're suffering for their faith. And that's why it's so important that we pray for them, that we pray for those believers, for instance, in North Korea or in parts of the Middle East or in Africa or wherever it may be in China where Christians are having to hold underground churches where if they're caught, more than likely they will be imprisoned and put to death. So we have to pray for them and share with them as the Lord enables us. Never forget that. Now the comments in verse 4 have to do with a very, very practical issue. Marriage. Over the past few decades, our culture has taken a U-turn away from the Christian view of marriage and sexual morality that, has, that, has, uh, that was prevalent before that time. Now, while divorce and sexual immorality are not new, they used to be frowned upon, and marital faithfulness was viewed as desirable. But beginning, but beginning in the 1960s, our culture threw off Christian standards and openly embraced free sex and easy divorce. Openness towards homosexuality and transgenderism began to make inroads so that now it's widely promoted as a way of life that shouldn't be condemned but be accepted as normal. Now, it would be naive to think that the church is insulated from these powerful cultural trends. But the fact is there are many right now, this time, that there are many pastors and churches out there who are agreeing with and actually participating in these anti-biblical lifestyles. Also, evangelicals, those who call themselves Christians aren't doing well in the area of sexual purity. Leadership, a journal for pastors, commissioned a poll back in, I know it's been a while, but um, this has happened, uh, this poll was back in 88, but again, you'll see what I'm saying here. Commissioned a poll to determine how common is pastoral indiscretion. They found that since entering the local church ministry, 23% of pastors had done something with someone other than their spouse that they considered sexually inappropriate. 12% admitted to having extramarital intercourse. Among those, were not, among those who were not pastors, the figure doubled. You could just imagine... These numbers now, 20 years later, 30, almost 30 years later, how much they probably have increased. And so the exhortation there in verse 4 is that marriage should be honored by all. And it's essential because it demonstrates that crisis people, Christians, were visible in the world. And that we ought... To be, to be seen as people who value, who value and honor marriage. Friends, church, marriage isn't an issue at the bottom of the priority list for Christians. Nor is it merely a secondary issue. Instead, marriage is high on the list. Marriage is to be honored by all is a, is a particularly comprehensive statement. It doesn't say, do not commit adultery. Rather, it's a positive statement. Christians should give public, 
visible honor and honor and private personal honor to marriage as a monogamous union of a man and woman. The writer gives a second related instruction. The marriage bed kept undefiled. Now there you can't get any more straightforward than that. The marriage bed kept undefiled. Now here it's clear that the author has sexual defilement in mind because of what he says next. Because God will judge the sexually moral and adulterers. Sexually immoral is a broader category that encompasses adultery. The Bible doesn't have a yes list and a no list when it comes to sexuality. There's no allowed list or prohibited list. Instead, the Bible teaches that sexual, sexual morality in all aspects and manifestations comes down to one central thing. And here's what I want you to, to, to listen to. Sex belongs in marriage, in marriage, in marriage, and nowhere else. Nowhere else. This here is a radical statement in today's world, but it's deeply biblical. Scripture recognizes sex within marriage as something good and worthy of celebration. If we had a checklist on sexual, sexual morality, sex within marriage would be on the yes list. But everything else would be the no, would be on the no list. Every form of sex outside of marriage subverts and dishonors marriage. And so, how does God judge fornicators and adulterers? Well, according to Romans chapter 1, verses 24 to 27, sometimes they're judged in their own bodies. And what I'm talking about here are STDs and various forms of other diseases. But those who aren't will certainly be judged at the final judgment. And let me again reiterate the importance of what I'm saying here. Whether it's heterosexual sex, homosexual sex, any kind of sex outside of marriage, it's wrong. It's a sin. And so what about believers? What about a believer who is committing these sins? Again, I'm not here to to judge you, and maybe you're watching, listening, maybe that's you. Maybe you're a believer who is, has a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you're out there having sex outside of marriage. Well, let me tell you this. You're probably still forgiven. Yes, you're probably saved. Again, I can't make that judgment. Only God knows. And only He knows if you are. And you'll find out once you get to heaven. But according to Ephesians 5.5, 5, they may find, you may find yourselves losing rewards in heaven. Remember, remember David was forgiven, but he suffered the consequences of his adultery for years 
and years to come. And he suffered in the hardest way through his own children. In these days, when sexual sins are paraded as entertainment in movies and on television, the church needs to take a stand for the purity of the marriage bond. Don't feel shy or ashamed to tell those around you that you believe in the biblical view of marriage between a man, one man, and one woman. And that's it. Not one man and five women. Not one man and one man. Not one woman and one woman. No, one man and one woman. That's what the Word of God tells us. A dedicated Christian home is the nearest thing to heaven on earth. And it starts, my friends, with a Christian marriage. Now, many of us who weren't believers or Christians at the time, we can look back now and say, man, I wish I would have waited. I wish I would have waited until I got married to experience this. For those who are young and haven't yet, aren't married, wait. Just wait. I know the world, you're going to get that pressure all around you. To do this, you know, to, to have sex outside of marriage, but don't listen to those voices. Again, the Lord has a plan and purpose. He has someone there. He's preparing someone just for you. And when you finally get married to him or her, if your heart is in the right place and his heart is in the right place, man, it's just going to be a blessed marriage. I'm not saying there aren't going to be issues like any other marriage. But, again, that union will be a blessed union. The late comedian George Burns used to say that he could remember the time when the air was clean and the sex was dirty. Biblically speaking, sex has never been dirty in the context that God ordained for it which is in lifelong covenant marriage between a man and a woman. That there is the right place for sex. The wrong place is outside of such covenant marriage, where again, it will incur God's judgment. And so if God's word is true, our culture is in moral darkness. But when darkness is greatest, the light shines the brightest. If we as believers, as Christians, maintain God's standards of moral purity, He will use us to shine in this dark world with the good news of God's forgiveness and with the news that, yes, sex is clean in God-ordained marriages. Well, again, now, moving on. The author then exhorts believers in verse 5 to live out the Tenth Commandment. Of the Ten Commandments, the Tenth, do not covet, is perhaps the most difficult for us to fully comprehend, even though it tells us specifically what we should avoid, coveting our neighbor's wife, our neighbor's animals, our neighbor's belongings, and so and so. But today's entire commercial economy is built on a foundation that not only encourages us to have what we want, but also wa want what we don't have. 
and also with the economic problems in our, just in our country alone, much less in the world today, comfortable Christians may soon find themselves doing without some luxuries that they now, right now, consider necessities. A Christian couple was ministering to believers in Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain. The couple had brought in Christian literature, blankets, and other necessary items. At the church gathering, the couple issued, assured the believers that Christians in America are praying for believers in Eastern Europe. We're happy for that, one believer replied. But we feel that Christians in America need more prayer than we do. We here in Eastern Europe are suffering but you in America are very comfortable. And it's always harder to be a good Christian when you're comfortable. See, folks, we live in a society and operate within an, econ an economy of covetousness. As a result, it's a difficult thing to live free from want and free from a love of money that can give us what we want. Now, here's another thing I want you to keep in mind about this verse. Verse 5. It isn't saying that money is the problem. That money is the issue. No, not at all. Instead, it's warning against the love of money. The love of money. And again, the second half of verse 5 and all of verse 6 tells us why we can be content. Why you can be content. Just be happy with what you have. The source of our contentment isn't the security and comfort we get from owning enough things. It's what we, it's that we serve a God who takes care of us. We serve a God who will never leave or forsake us. This is something that God himself has promised. He will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, the degree to which I realize the Lord is with me, the degree to which I uh, enjoy his fellowship intimately is the degree to which I'll be content continually. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Those of you married or have been married you remember those early days of when you were first married? When you were living on beans and decorating bookshelves made of bricks and boards? You had, you didn't have much materially. But you don't even notice those things. It doesn't even matter to you because you're together, you're in love. And love brings true contentment and satisfaction. You get that? Love brings true contentment and satisfaction. So too, if I'm in love with the Lord, I will not covet. I will be content with whatever I have simply because he is with me. So, I'm telling you, you ought to be content as well with what you have as a believer. Don't look around at what others have and wish that you had it. Be content that the Lord is with you. That ought to be enough, more than enough. A woman said to evangelist D.L. Moody, I have found a promise that helps me when I'm afraid. 
It's Psalm 56, 3. What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Mr. Moody replied, I have a better promise than that. Isaiah 12, 2. I will trust and not be afraid. See, both those promises from those psalms are true, and each has its own application. The important thing is that we know Jesus as our Lord and Helper, and that we not put our trust in material things, not to put your trust in what's in your wallet, on, what you, on your handheld device, on the clothes that you have, on the kind of car you're driving. Don't put your thing, your trust in those things. Put your trust in the Lord. Contented Christians, those Christians who are content, are people with priorities. Guess what? Material things aren't high on their priority lists. Sure, we can lose everything we have. And you know what? It'll be okay. It'll be fine. As long as we continue to endure in the faith. You can lose your house, your car, your job. All those material things. But you must continue to endure. That's what you're called to do. You see, we have everything we need, we need in Christ. And we can be content because we serve a God who cares for us. We serve a God who's on our side. God, my friends, is on your side. So where do you begin to cultivate contentment that will never disappoint? Well, you have to start at the right place. A.W. Tozer had it right when he said, the man who has God for his treasure has all things in one. A Puritan sat down to his meal and found that he only had little bread and some water. His response was to exclaim, what? All this and Jesus too? George Mueller used to say at the first business of every day is to be truly at rest and happy in God. And so, my friends, my fellow brother and sister in Christ, if you're struggling to be content with what you have and where you're at, start there. Just rest. And be happy in God. And the more you do that, the more you just rest in Him. And just find that joy in God. The more it just, you will start to become content with more and more things. Well, you'll be more content regardless of what's going on, regardless of what you lose. Make sure to spend time each day pulling out those weeds of greed and cultivate plant those good seeds those seeds that are found in the word of god that's again where you will find contentment you will also find contempt being content reading the Word of God, finding those words in here that will encourage you. Pull out those weeds of greed, my friend. So again, just to summarize what we covered here just in these six verses. As believers, we're to show brotherly love or to hold marriage in high honor, to keep the marriage bed undefiled, and we're to guard our hearts from the love 
of money. And one other thing I think, you know, I, I wanted to mention about this, you know, what the, what the Bible here is saying, what our passage here is saying about money is, I think it's also saying to be smart about your money. Make wise choices and decisions. Make sure that you also invest wisely on whatever it is, again, the Lord has given you. This is a concept that I just recently started adopting into my own life, my own finances. I'm thinking long-term, and so rather than having our money just sitting in a bank account where it's not accumulating anything. I have it in a rollover IRA in other areas where, you know, it is, you know, making a, a return uh, on that investment. The Lord has given us so many tools we can use. So, be wise. Again, with what God has given you. There's nothing wrong with, you know, making right decisions about money. Just don't love it. Don't make that all about your entire life. I've seen many YouTube videos of people who that's all they talk about. That's all they want to do. That's all they're looking for is to, you know, become rich. But they don't realize they don't really understand what that means. And to quote a well-known rapper, rapper, Biggie Smalls, more money, more problems. More money, my friends. More problems. Be content. Many more things here that... Um, I could have covered more into, into detail, but with the time that we have, I left. I want to take some time to speak to those that are watching and listening and who are wanderous or walking around in this world with no clue, no insight, or understanding how good and wonderful and amazing God the Father is. Well, I want to tell you that He loves you very much and He sent His Son to die for you on the cross. He paid the penalty he suffered for us he paid he paid off our debt a debt that we had incurred because of all of our sin that we would never have been able to pay back and he took it all and it cost him his life just so that you will be forgiven so if you're ready to place your faith and trust, you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that he rose three days later and is now sitting at the right hand of God in heaven. I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So again, if you're ready to be born again, come to the cross and pray this with your eyes closed and your head bowed pray this with all sincerity Lord Jesus I admit that I'm a sinner and I confess that now to you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I now believe that you died for all those sins 
all of my sins and that you rose from the dead three days later. So now I repent and I turn away from my sins and I confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me. Fill me abundantly with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me and teach me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Friends, if you prayed that, I want to welcome you to the family of God. And truly, the Lord now is your heavenly Father, and we're all your brothers and sisters in Christ. And you want to, I want to show you my brotherly love by praying for you, maybe helping you in your next steps of your Christian walk. So reach out to us, and we, I want to help you with that. Um, we can send you a Bible, or we can you know, maybe lead you to a good church where you will be taught the Word of God. Again, it's, it's an amazing, wonderful, beautiful time now, and God's going to use you to do some great things. It's going to be a bumpy road. Talk to any Christian or anyone that's been a Christian for a long time, and they're going to tell you that it hasn't been easy, but the rewards at the end of it all outweigh whatever's going on here. So, um, yes, I encourage you, surround yourself with other believers. Thank you for those watching and listening online. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. I hope that you were blessed. As I mentioned in the beginning, please share this video to anyone that, um, that you think might be blessed by it. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week as we continue in this final chapter of this letter to the Hebrews. And, um, and yeah, just be blessed this week. Be safe. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.